only really works when you've got true scale, when you get, when everyone has access, when you turn it inside out and, and allow everyone to participate in the ecosystem. Hello and welcome to the Blockchain Pro Podcast. I'm Adriana Bellotti and today I'm speaking to Rob Allen of the HBA Foundation. We talk about connecting different blockchains to fully achieve the Web3 promise. Let's go. Hi, Rob. Hey, how are you How are you doing? Really good, really good, thank you. Thanks for meeting me and for doing this today. I think you have a really interesting story and I cannot wait to share it. So let's dig into it. Okay, let's do it. Go back in time, tell me how you started your career. I know you've, li- oh, wow. you've led an interesting professional life. I certainly have. Originally in the UK, born in East London. Ran away and joined the army when I was 16. Went through Sandhurst and um, became an engineer. Got an IT degree and found myself in Iraq and um, subsequently joined a, uh, a battlefield computer systems team to kind of use my, um, my, my IT degree. And we, um, we spent maybe seven, eight years just traveling around the world supporting this, uh, this system that we built. It was a very distributed, um, transactionally secure, resilient um, system, which you know these days would have probably built as a blockchain. But um, of course, back in 1990X, we had no idea of blockchain. So we built these things in different ways. But the, the, the core con- the core principles were always there, and I've, I always think back to how we may have done it differently, um, given the, the technology that we have today. But then I left the army at, uh, when I was 30, and um, segued, as you do, into, um, well, I, I wanted to use my computer um, skills and my experience, and didn't want to go into desk jobs. So I left and joined Intel, and spent two years um, at Intel, mostly in California uh, on supply chain systems, which was uh, which is great fun. Really loved that period because I was working in, in an area of, with people who are super, super bright, way, way brighter than I was and learn, learned a lot and, and managed to transition from that kind of um, former life into, into what I wanted to, to do. Came back to the UK um, and started contracting. I was a contract developer and contract um, Kind of solutions architect, as we call them now, and then ultimately ended up in banks. So I started working um, for the UK's biggest uh, building society called the Nationwide, and on supply chain and on customer relationship management systems. And then I got an opportunity to uh, get into payments. And um, then for the next eight to ten years, specialised in payment systems and some core banking, but but mainly payments. And that meant that I was exposed uh, at exactly the right time to things like faster payments in the UK, so near real-time payment systems, to uh, what was happening in Europe with SEPA, the uh, single euro um, payments area um, standards. I worked at Lloyds Bank and and Barclays Bank and Credit Suisse, just building payment systems. And, And it was during that journey, 2012, 2013, Bitcoin came on my radar late for some, early for others. But um, from an engineering perspective, I kind of discounted it because um, I didn't um, spend enough time understanding the sea change that it was going to bring about in terms of both, not, not just the technology, but the, the real ecosystem that it would generate. I don't think many people kind of fully understood it. I certainly read the white paper back, back then and thought it was really smart, but um, couldn't kind of fit it into my my particular context. Roll forward a couple of years and I was um, I was at Nordea Bank in Scandinavia trying to integrate 63 odd um, payment systems into into one, which was the kind of the, the old school way of building systems of course, you know, you don't switch up the old one and put a new one in and no one ever remembers to switch the old one off, so we had 63. And Nordea joined the R3 consortium and um, that gave me my first exposure properly to you know, blockchain, albeit you know, the, the R3 version of um, blockchain that became Corda, and forced me to do some deep thinking around the, the different architectural models for, um, for blockchains. 
and then I really I really got it you know I sort of it really um, bit but from an enterprise perspective it was always going to be private and permissioned and you know there are that all that comes with all sorts of kind of um, additional weight which was always that trade-off you know that trilemma that we talk about you know I, I didn't think it was worth the effort to and still don't to build a private permissioned blockchain you know there's there's some there were some very good use cases in 2014 2015 and reasons for doing that but the public ledger space has now come in so far that all of those private and permission blockchains in my view are kind of carrying technical debt that they don't didn't need to have and that's part of the evolution of the, the, the space from an engineering perspective. Anyway, I post, post Mordea, I came to, came to Australia. So that was six years ago, and I, I joined PwC, um, ostensibly to set up a payments practice. But when I got here, I realized that the opportunities were in the fintech space. And so the payments practice became a fintech practice, and then we had to credentialize um, the fintech um, aspects of that. And I had all, everything I needed, which was blockchain right and that's when you and I met exactly. and I started kind of uh, six years right um, started doing all the meetups and and kind of absorbing what was going on in the community and the energy and you know the fun so that was 2016 so that's a year before you know all the ICO craziness and everything and we were talking a lot about a lot about Bitcoin you know, Ethereum had been, was a couple of years old, and maybe one year old actually. Many of us were going to consensus in New York, um, and there was a real buzz um, growing around around the space then, which which I loved. And at PwC, we built. Um, I wanted to build a crypto bank, but of course that wouldn't have worked really within PwC. So what you know, we looked at the payments use cases. We looked at payments cross-border payments, which is still a really good use case for, for blockchain. And um, we built this platform called Vulcan, tested it with Barclays, my old um, bank, and did a cross-border use case into India, which was very, very successful. And I wanted to build it as a, uh, as a kind of blockchain agnostic layer. So many uh, projects now talk about blockchain agnosticism and you know, multi-chain approaches. And of course, we all understand now that interoperability is key, you know, across the space, and um, being able to to scale is about, you know, being able to um, interoperate. And so um, we tested all that sort of stuff out. And the, the project itself uh, it was was pretty early. Um, it was quite difficult to get traction. And I ultimately left um, PwC to set up my own consultancy, kind of working in in the blockchain space, but specific to the sustainable development goals. I've always been a conservationist. I've always been a tree hugger. Um, you know, I believe we all- Shark hugger. I, I'm, a, I'm a shark hugger, absolutely. Shark <laughs> photographer and um, conservationist for like 25 years. So um, those are the things that make me want to get up in the morning. And you know, there's, there's enough use cases in the sustainability space to keep anyone interested for years, whether it be biodiversity or conservation. Renewable energy, you know, carbon, broken carbon markets, habitat renewal, um, social justice, you know, that, that, that full gambit of um, sustainable development goals. And so I did, did that and we, I worked with the Asian Development Bank on fintech um, throughout the Pacific on strat strategy work. I worked with impact funds um, designing security tokens. We did renewable energy, we did waste management, circular economy stuff. So it's re really, really cool. And then I ultimately ended up being asked to build the digital identity business for FPOS here. That wasn't initially a, um, a blockchain use case, it's a federated model, but COVID was about to lock us all down a couple of years ago. And so it was a really good gig to, you know, I've been around the startup space a lot. I've been kind of mentoring and advising. I'm on the board of a few startups. So it was a really good time to kind of bring together both the, the, you know, that experience and skill, but also you know, a lot of the people that I knew in the space. And um, for FPOS, I became their entrepreneur in residence, focusing primarily on the digital identity business, which is called Connect ID. But also while I was there, I was able to introduce them to Hedera Hashgraph, which is the technology that I've been aware of for four years, five years. And from an engineering perspective, it's all, always resonated with me as being um, able to address a lot of the, the promises of blockchain from the early days, but um, the, that weren't fulfilled. You know, those that required scale or require, required a public ledger or require 
um, some way of fairly ordering you know, at a transactional level the, um, the, the the transactions on the network. So, and being a payments guy, the killer app for me for Hedera has always been micropayments. So, how do you, on a public ledger, actually scale to you know, device level interactions at the subcent um, kind of, uh, value level? And so I, uh, FPOS agreed to run a proof of concept on Hedera for micropayments, which went really well. It went so well that we were invited to join the governing council. Um, and Hedera Hashgraph is unique in many ways, but one of the innovations that it brings to market is this kind of oversight from the governing council, which is made up of a variety of diverse organizations, all well-known brands with you know, big reputations and the ability to, to bootstrap this, this proof of stake um, distributed ledger network. So I was lucky enough to have been a journeyman on the, you know, and, and fanboy for, uh, for Hedera for three or four years, you know, built some, some technology on it, built a couple of businesses on it. And then I ended up on the governing council for, for FPOS. In August last year, I kind of concluded my mission, which was to kind of build the Connect ID business and hand it back. FPOS has been through emerging you know, with the other payment schemes in uh, in Australia, so Australian Payments Plus has brought all of those together, and um, and then I was free. I was free to go and do um, some other things, and as luck would have it, Hedera, which was going through the, the normal layer one protocol process of decentralization and, and creating a foundation to you know to distribute tokens to create uh, business value and commercialize the network. This foundation was being set up called the HBAR Foundation and um, I was given the opportunity to join. So um, all my Christmases came at once, I guess. You know, it was it was the right place, right time and um, the team I knew, the technology I knew intimately and um, I was given the opportunity to um, both lead the sustainability vertical because we've got four pillars in the foundation. So um, I get to scratch my sustainability itch and, and focus on businesses that are value aligned to the things that I like to do. And I'm also responsible for the startup layer. So the ecosystem acceleration part. So working with accelerators, with, with universities, with um, incubators to enable as many startups as possible to join the ecosystem. And that brings us to today. So that's, that's my journey. That, that was I'm quite old, so it's quite a long story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't say old, experience. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, we are about the same age, so um, I found myself young and experienced. Absolutely. Uh, one thing that you said that, that I mean, amongst many other interesting things is like we are now moving to a conversation is, that is focused on multi-chain. Mm -hmm. And nothing is going to work if we don't figure that out, right? The same way the internet wouldn't have worked if we didn't figure that out back then. Because Absolutely. the internet started very separated and people tried to create it, all these little silos of yeah. the internet. And we would not have been where we are right now if we didn't solve that problem. Now. So how do you see the road to solving this problem? It's a big problem to solve. It, it is a big problem. It's... Um... And it's not just the internet. I mean, the wires in the internet, you know, pre-web were quite siloed as well. I mean, people forget the layer upon layer upon layer that kind of has been put in place over decades to get to where we are today. Um, we kind of, we rationalize this cloud-based thing, but it's still data centers, you know, with kind of fiber and, 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 co and connectivity. So, you know, the, the 90s meant that we were all living in silos, AOL or CompuServe or, you know, all, all of the, um, you know, web one kind of um, uh, approach that w was a natural part of the evol evolution. And it's not just the web, you know, payment services, they're not payment services, um, mobile services. You know, there was, a, there was a time when I couldn't text you, I couldn't send you an SMS unless we were on the same network, right? The silos don't scale. So, you know, if you live in a silo, it's great for that business, if that's a good business, but ultimately it will wither and die like a walled garden does. So you need to break down the walls in order to scale, and then everyone benefit, benefits from that network effect. We talk about network effect, you know, like it's, it's in, in a very glib way, but actually network effects, you know, layer upon layer upon layer of value being added into an ecosystem is the way that the, the tide rises and all the boats get lifted. So yeah, time and time again, you see this happening. Um, the early days of the web, 
um, about um, telcos, uh, payment services. So in, in Africa, for example, you know the, the uh, mobile payments kind of leapfrogged all of the banking in, in terms of you know, financial inclusion. Um, in Brazil too. I think. And in Brazil too, yeah. So only really works when you've got true scale, when you get when everyone has access, when you turn it inside out and, and allow everyone to participate in the ecosystem. And then of course it exposes, you know, bad act not bad actors, but you know, poor businesses and good businesses and then the, the cream rises to the top. And we're we're at that stage now with, you know, um, a multitude of, of layer one protocols. Some good, some bad, some more centralized than others, some you know more decentralized, some you know you can switch off a whole layer one protocol with you know a, a very small discord, discord channel reaching agreement, right? Um, or you can fail to, to switch off a network and, and it has life, you know, like Bitcoin, you know, you, you, the China thing, you know, it, it shows its true resilience. But there aren't many protocols that have that level of decentralization and resilience like Bitcoin. I mean, it went under the radar for so long. It has established itself for so, so long. You, you couldn't do it today because it would be DDoS attacked or civil attacked, you know, and, and out of existence. Bitcoin is a unique case. It's absolutely unique. And it's the granddaddy of, of them all. And is, I truly believe, whatever people um, think, you know, is is the the bedrock, you know, of of everything else that happens. You're not going to build a metaverse on Bitcoin, but it's not there to, to build metaverses on, right? And you're not going to scale it to do you know IoT device transactions even with Lightning, but you can do all sorts of things with it, and it and it provides that slow and steady kind of bedrock. But then all the other layer one protocols, you know, are are in a competitive space, and they have you know um, pros and cons. So. People don't seem to have, I talk about this quite a lot, people don't seem to have that principle view anymore that it's all about decentralization and it's all about you know, sovereignty. When you've got you know, um, JPEGs of apes you know, making such you know, high prices on, on, on the NFT market, that, that retail adoption wave that we're going through at the moment isn't really being driven largely by crypto libertarians. And they don't really care about the decentralization. And I know that kind of is, is a, a cause for great consternation for, for those of us who have been around for a long, long while and, and see the benefits and, and the reasons why Bitcoin was created, you know, the, the reasons why Ethereum has been so successful, because it's all about sovereignty and disintermediation and taking control. You know. So um, some 18-year-old trading Board apes isn't really thinking about that, but that's fine too. So, that, so my point is, the technologies suit the purpose, you know, and, and what, with my consulting hat on, um, you know, what problem is being solved and what technology suits it. And blockchain does very little on its own, other than adding a trust layer. And so the question is, do you, you know, um, do you trust it? And, it, and is it trustworthy enough for your purposes? And then, then, then there's kind of unintended consequences. You know, who would have expected you know, the, the, the surge in JPEG trading to actually um, ignite the whole metaverse debate? But it, but it actually did, because what blockchains provide ultimately is property rights over digital assets. And then you've got, you know, you've got the, the nucleus, the, the, the unit of value um, seeded for, for an entire metaverse. So look what you know, the guys at Zedrun are doing. You know, they created digital horses you know, and nothing else. And from, a, from a, an NFT that looked like a digital horse with some color, uh, they created racing, they created breeding, they created um, a whole kind of metaverse forming around it, and then multiple metaverses. And this is a huge Australian success story built on, built on blockchain. Oh, it's on Polygon at the moment, so, you know. It's like finally a type of horse racing that I can get behind, because well, I've always found the other one very cruel. No, no project. talk of, uh, of glue and donkeys, but um, actually what I'll end up doing is retiring horses, you know, to, a, to the, um, the pasture, the green pastures. But the, the, the point is, the, the really, really interesting thing, just observing how that has developed over two or three years, and there's plenty of other examples, of course, you know, Axie and all the play to earn um, movement and the um, and some of the amazing um, 
graphical um, experiences that are coming along in you know, the likes of Illuvium and, and Red Village and, and others. It, it's just mass adoption appearing before our eyes and, and we know that it's underpinned by these technologies and we know that it's, it's there. And, and one, you know, a player of one game or a, a, a player of another game don't really care that one's on Polygon and one's on Solana and one's on you know, Ethereum or, or, um, or Hedera even. Um, what they really want is to be able to transfer their magic sword between the games that they, you know, they like to play, and they, they don't want friction and moving between the games because they put so much investment and time in. And so, um, ultimately, the, the the requirements to interoperate will come from the users, which is as it should be, right? Because otherwise, it's technology for technology's sake. But we need to be one step ahead of them, knowing that that's what's coming and create the bridges and the validator networks and the gateways that enable that to happen because that ecosystem then benefits everybody. And it's interesting um, being able to have this evolution of taking your asset from game one to game two because that is impossible right now. So it is an evolution of gaming. Absolutely. And I cannot wait for the time that, that I'll be able to take my mansion from The Sims 4 <laughs> into some metaverse and have my Sims live there. Yeah, and you know, do things on their own because that would be really cool. Yeah, and you know, boomers and jacks like me kind of can be a bit sniffy about it. But actually, there's there's a the, the gaming use case. Quite apart from the fact it's a trillion dollar industry, you know, and, and esports is just massive, and and the metaverse is just going to be um, be crazy this year and, and, and going forward. You know, I've written quite a lot on things like smart cities and financial and other types of infrastructure that need to underpin smart cities. And, and a smart city doesn't only have to exist in the you know, real world. It's not a meat space only thing because you know, in a world where we have metaverses, there's no reason why we can't have digital twins of smart cities. So, you know, the the, the future, you know, our children or the, you know, the the next generation will probably not differentiate between a digital twin of the, the, the place they exist and, and live, and because the brands are going to be in both places, they're going to have physical assets that are transferable into into the metaverse. You know, their their sneakers and their their branded clothing and their you know their their special items will have have digital twins. And and that's that's what gives the individuals their, their identity. And so in a world where you know you design new cities, you'll be designing cities in metaverses. You'll, you'll create the, the, the infrastructure um, you'll design them with you know, um, financial infrastructure that is based on blockchains or dig uh, distributed ledgers you know, that, that scale. And that city you know, uh, metaverse will actually then form the real world version of that, but it will, will, it will persist. And citizens of these spaces will be able to move seamlessly between the two. Uh, I think that's incredibly uh, exciting because all of the augmented reality, all of the virtual reality experiences that we now consider gaming will be real life as well. And there will be no difference between real life and, and metaverse life. It will just be life. That's so hard to wrap our heads around this sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all underpinned by, by this, these sorts of technologies. And it's, of course, it's AI and it's IoT and it's cloud and, and, and edge and, and, and all of the, the technologies will combine to actually create these, the, these spaces. But trust layers, financial infrastructure should flow like water utilities or should flow like data utilities or like you know, electricity, power utilities. Um, financial and um, and property, I think so. Property rights, like I keep saying, is is the um, I think the fundamental beneficial property of distributed ledgers. You know, one's one's property is definable and provable as one's own, and that doesn't matter whether it's a coin, it's a unit of value, it's a reward point, it's an NFT, you know, it's a digital twin for a pair of sneakers. All of that kind of has to go across rails, and those rails, you know, will be will be blockchains and distributed ledgers. And then one city might be based on you know one distributed ledger and another city might be based on another distributed ledger and of course they've got a trade, e-commerce and, and uh, transferability of, of all sorts of um, assets will be necessary and we come back to interoperability. Right? So at, at a meta level it works as well as, as at a kind of unique and um, human level. And then you know my main drive here is really to design systems that are you know zero waste, 
and circular economy based and regenerative and heal uh, both the people who exist within them and, and the world in general, and provably so. You know, so you don't get greenwashing, you get you know, trusted, transparent systems that, are, um, that, that work for everyone and are exploitative and consumptive and you know, linear. That's my, that's my vision of the future world and, and why, why it's worth investing in all of these you know, games and cul-de-sac technologies because it's all advancing us forward, it's all taking us in the right direction. And when we talk investing, if we're not talking about investing your money, we're talking about investing your time, time. in understanding how Absolutely. these work. Absolutely, yeah. And your money as well, if you want. But, uh... That's a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so, and building all of this in public infrastructure. Yes. Uh, and on that, I think Hedera had a big announcement a couple of weeks we did, ago. We yeah. did. I mean, it's a surprise to a lot of people, I think, because Hedera has been painted with this you know, patented corporate um, type chain, which, which uh, was not for us. You know, I'm sort of giving, giving the inverted comments there. Um, but actually, if you if you listen to the, pod, the early day podcasts and, and uh, webinars that uh, Dr. Lehman Baird and Matt Harmon gave, that there's a path to decentralization. There was always a process. And uh, the announcement two weeks ago was that the full stack is being open sourced. The Hedera organization is being decentralized. The governing council remain to kind of oversee the, the, the network and do its, do its job. But the team, which had um, previously been kind of halved anyway, because all the business development elements, the, the team had been moved into the foundation, the Edge Foundation. The remaining team members, the technologists, the developer advocates, Lehman and Mans themselves, would be going to Swirls. And Swirls was the original startup that kind of kicked this all off. So that's effectively the labs. You know, that's effectively the you know the um, the core the, team, the technology so to speak. think tank. Yeah. So it, it, yeah, it's like the core team. It, it's it's like uh, well, yeah. Every every um, layer one process has a, has similar teams that kind of oversee the the core infrastructure um, components and the uh, and other the center of excellence, but not necessarily the only um, group that is developing on the network. So we've got um, we've got the HIPS, which is the Hedera Improvement Protocol. So anyone can contribute and, and feed back into into the um, GitHub repositories and, and contribute to the development of the network. We've got a, a governance layer, which I think is the best in in the space because it's not built around you know a cult of personality or a, a shady group of core developers or uh, you know there, there, there's a kind of enterprise grade level of, of um, governance here which by the way is only there really for the process of bootstrapping the network when the when the first when the decision was made to patent the lowest layer and the, people don't understand really that the the vast 95 percent of the stack was already open source but the, the hash graph algorithm at the, the very base was patented. It was open review, you could still look at the code, but there were both legal and technical controls around the, um, around the hash graph algorithm. And the reason for that was in 2017, when all this was forming, you'll remember, you know, Bitcoin became Bitcoin Cash, became Bitcoin Gold, became BSB, you know, that every day there seemed to be another fork of the Bitcoin network. And then Ethereum went through its own problems and Actually, Ethereum hard forks quite a lot. The, the decision was made to, to have an enterprise grade public ledger, not one of those you know, private permissioned you know, distributed databases. Um, so, a public ledger with all the benefits of a public ledger that is proof of stake, you would need to have some level of control during this bootstrapping phase. And Matt Harmon and Lehman have, have, have talked always about having a hundred year company, having this network to be a common good, to be there for the, for, for the world. Um, I, I often kind of like, I liken it to another layer of the internet, but not a distributed ledger, not, not a blockchain thing. It's, it's kind of the new trust layer that is that the next onion layer that is the, the stack of protocols that form the internet. So um, open sourcing, it was just a natural phase and was always planned. And it's, it's a real relief to me because I don't have to defend it all the time. For, anymore. For be, anymore, for being you know, corporate and, and patented because we've hit that stage now. So we've, we've come out of beta with the next version. So it will be um, version 1.0. 
Um, we've got um, an open source uh, technology stack. We've got a decentralized um, governing council. We've got 25 um, organizations on the governing council now, across decentralized across the world, across time zones, across sectors. There's um, for profits and not for profits. There's a, uh, academic institutions in there. So, you know, there's a, there's a having sat on the governing council, I know how diverse the uh, the contributions are but how amazing the collaborations are you know in in terms of um, advancing this technology and so we're into a kind of a new dawn um, ongoing frustration for me is that the, the announcements always come at the wrong time <laughs> so this announcement came at a time where you know the markets were falling like stones and um, you know it was red across the board and it seems that every time we've got we've had a really good announcement, yeah, you know, there's been something in the ecosystem out of our control that's been, you know, that's trumped it or, you know, it's, it's too too noisy to, to get through. But I but I really hope that over time, you know, we 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 will have a there'll be a, an increased understanding. We've got a really, really good community to be fair. We've got a strong community, they've been through quite a lot over the last three or four years. And um, and they're building some amazing things because it's really easy to build on Hedera. You know, the APIs are, are really um, very easy to kind of interact with. You don't need to be a Solidity developer. You can you know, develop a Node or GoLang or um, Python or whatever. And and you've got the consensus service for you know, provenance and data recording and, and timestamping. And you've got the token service for um, for creating tokens. And if you want to write smart contracts, you've got Smart Contracts 2.0, which is based on the, uh, the Hyperledger Basu um, EVM. So you can migrate smart contracts directly off of your other EVM onto, onto Hedera, and they'll run at three, 400 transactions a second, which isn't you know, the 10,000 or more that Hedera can run at, but for some, for some instances, it's OK. And, and much cheaper. Hugely cheaper because the, the costs, you don't pay gas fees, you pay the um, transaction fees that are paid to Fiat. So you, it's predictable, it's, it's scalable, and it can, uh, it's one hundredth of a cent to, uh, to make a, a consensus call and uh, one tenth of a cent to, to um, interact with the token. We, we think Hedera is well placed for the, the use cases that need to scale and need to really benefit from a public ledger but also scale. Um, and break that break that trilemma that um, has been the um, the bugbear of uh, blockchains since um, 2008. It really exciting times. I think this year will be be, be um, really fun. I've just kicked off um, our first accelerator uh, relationship with Outlier Ventures uh, just just a few days ago, and that's the first of um, a number of uh, similar announcements that cover. The whole world. Uh, there'll be some very specific um, thematic cohorts, and there'll be some kind of regional ones, and some that anyone can join. And so, combining the kind of the founder community with the opportunities that the accelerators uh, provide, and the grant funding. And to be fair, we, we've got quite a large pot, grant pot to uh, to distribute. That, along with, with initiatives like the interoperability that we were talking about, um, there's a number of um, really good ways to interoperate with Hedera coming up that um, I think will resonate with the community. And, and some of the things that, that um, people want from their, their, their blockchain, from their network, you know, the likes of DeFi and yielding and staking and NFTs um, and you know, all of the use cases that uh, are really very compelling will be, um, will be with us um, in a, in a very short time. Are there NFTs on Hedera yeah. already? What yeah. is the most uh, famous one? We just made an announcement of a collaboration with Metaverse, without any. So it's and they've got quite a lot of um, really good NFTs come out. At the moment, there's there's uh, there's a very strong community around uh, hash punks, which is obviously very derivative, but um, is inspiring a lot of interest. So. Um, you know, I'm a fan of um, of any of those those community projects because they're driving innovation and they're testing testing the infrastructure and you know the wallets are, are forming around the need rather than um, anything else. So um, I don't really want to call out any anyone. I think the the hash punks um, project is probably the OG of uh, of um, the, the Hedera NFT space, but. Very, very soon, NFTs with utility will, will be the, you know, like I was talking about Zed earlier, but, um, but there, there are many others. And um, we've got some pretty big announcements coming up in the uh, NFT and metaverse space over the, over the coming weeks. So um, 
to watch this space. I'm kind of holding back all sorts of really exciting <laughs> stuff. But um, well, you know, uh, we're going to publish this on the first of March. Oh, are you okay? Well, maybe we'll do an edit. <laughs> we can do a, like a very quick <laughs> addendum. Okay. Well, let, we can do that. I'm, I'm not really sure of the timing. Things that have been announced: Al Raffman, um, who is a massive, massive Bollywood, Indian Bollywood um, director and a musician, has just. Um, we just announced a couple of weeks ago that um, we're partnering with him on um, creating a, 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 you know, a platform that's effectively using the token service and NFTs to um, to support musicians. We announced uh, before that the also Galaxy. So Galaxy is Spencer Dinwiddie, who's an NBA you know uh, basketball star, um, building an NFT platform for you know social interaction and um, kind of monetization of future income and and, uh, and, and incentivizing you know the, the fans around celebrity. So that's that's really cool as well. But these are all utility type NFTs and not just your kind of flat uh, JPEGs, although there's plenty of those as well. I've got some very cool um, Yoda pixelated um, <laughs> NFTs that uh, came out from one of the projects and, um, and, some, and some cool Marvel characters. I'm not sure they've got the trademark for all of those. So in, in the sustainability space, I just wanted to spend a little time talking about what we're, what we're doing that because this really is my passion area. I've been lucky enough to be teamed up with um, some guys who came out of Hedera who've been focusing for a couple of years on, on the sustainability space. UCL created, wrote a report uh, last year. In fact, UCL, the University College London, joined the governing council off the back of the, the understanding that they got from doing this report. And the report um, is about the you know, the green credentials of the respective layer, the pr uh, proof of stake layer two, uh, layer one protocols. And um, Hedera has kind of scientifically um, and academically been proven to be, you know, magnitudes better than every other protocol on, on the basis of the, uh, the metrics that we use. That's really, really important because if you're building sustainability solutions, if you're doing carbon markets, or if you're doing um, tokenized biodiversity, if you're doing um, habitat renewal or regeneration, you don't really want to carry the carbon debt you know, in, into the solution because you're having to offset or, or, or address you know, the, um, the running of the network before you even sort of uh, get to the point of the, the default position of, of neutrality. With Hedera, the emissions, the the impact of that of the network is so small that it, you know we've offset it. Or in fact, we've more than more than offset it. So we're actually carbon carbon uh, negative as a, as a network. So if, if that and that's that's a public um, document that anyone can read. So on that basis, on that foundation, these guys in Hedera, um, led by one of the brightest people I've ever met, called Wes Geisenberger have designed a full set of infrastructure which we're open sourcing over time for the adoption of the Hedera network for sustainability solutions and it's called Guardian. And the Guardian technology effectively ingests data from let's say a solar farm project or a, um, a wind turbine project or a agricultural land regeneration project or even you know biodiversity or habitat renewal or, or anything in that kind of sustainability front where at the moment we've got marketplaces that have assets that are not granular are not searchable um, you know if you want to if you're a corporate that wants needs to go and buy a carbon credit or an offset it's very difficult to know where you're buying it from has it been double spent you know has it been properly retired is that that forestry um, project that you're investing in has it been clear cut? You know, you, there's, there's no way for a, a chief risk officer or a chief uh, financial officer who is kind of um, charged with managing the ESG aspects of running a business, and, and every business has to do that right now. So everyone, ha everyone um, by law, have to um, account for the non-financial risk associated with impact. So where, if you're Microsoft, where do you go to to buy these gigatons of offsets that uh, that you need to demonstrate in your accounts that you're you're kind of um, neutral or net zero at the time? With the Guardian, we are able to tokenize on the Hedera network all of this data, this stream of data that comes from IoT devices, digital signatures, all within the the kind of codification of a policy. Which are all, all established, right? So if you're if you're um, building a solar farm and you want to create 
create carbon credits that people can buy, you know, it's got to be installed correctly, it's got to be certified, it's got to be operated in a particular way, it's got to be audited. Those are very manual processes at the moment. Um, so we, we have designed a way to, to do that all automatically and use the Hedera network, both the provenance of the data, so using the consensus service, and tokenizing that digital asset in a very fi high fidelity, fi fine grain way. Then you're searchable. So if you're a South Australian business that has impact in South Australia, let's say a wine supply chain, um, or wine production supply chain, you can say, I want to offset in South Australia this kind of impact. And you can search on an open marketplace because these tokens expose this sort of data. That's very interesting. So the, the infrastructure requires us to do, do three things. We're going to uh, build the Guardian, which we've done, and it's open source, and anyone can download it and test it right now. We're going to create a library of policies, which are the thing that the Guardian ingests and then takes data and checks the things. And we're going to build an automated decentralized marketplace for these tokens. Um, called the ARM, the Aut Automated Regression Market. And all of this is, is open source, right? So it's all available to, for people to see right now. We're in the process of building the, the marketplace. But um, the technology is good for, for prime time right now. And we've got a number of projects. In fact, we've got many, many projects using Guardian to, to deliver sustainability outcomes. In this way, we are helping everyone have, have a better life and, um, and saving the planet for future ge generations. Mm -hmm. I get up with a spring in my step and um, a twinkle in my eye and um, yeah, love my job. Yeah, you're living the dream. <laughs> That's right. Amazing. All right, so let's do the quick three before we, ah, okay. before we get to the end. Right, go, on, go for it. What book are you reading? I'm reading um, a book I was given for Christmas um, called Land Rover by Ben Fogel. I know there's a little bit of a, um, a paradox here, but uh, given it's uh, the emissions that Land Rover defenders um, kind of emit, but I don't use it very often. Um, I'm a big Land Rover fan, being an ex-military guy, and um, I love the whole iconography around the um, Land Rover defender. So I'm just learning about the history of it and everything that's happened. And Ben Fogel writes uh, in a way which is very um, digestible. So that's what I'm reading. Sounds interesting. I love yeah. four-wheel driving as well. Yeah, it's great fun, isn't it? Yeah, we can offset the carbon. It's all fine. Well, you, you know what? I I have a plan to um, to do just that. Watch this space. Oh yeah, watch this space indeed. Uh, what's your favorite crypto resource? I I I take feeds from all over the place. Um, I'm a member of a WhatsApp group here uh, that's run by some uh, mutual friends of ours called the uh, Digital Asset Symposium, which um, gives us um, lots of intel. I, I live, I camp on crypto Twitter, um, which clearly isn't um, that, that unbiased. Um, and um, I just subscribe to all the, all the data streams. It probably takes two to three hours of my day, usually, to um, and to consume and filter all the, the data feed. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm energized and love the space, so it doesn't... Uh, Are you an early morning person or a night owl? I get up at 5 a.m. Um, wow. And uh, go to the gym, and then I'm ready for the day. Nice. But I, I kind of pass out, usually around 9.30. <laughs> the unfortunate thing, being based in Australia and having a global organization, is that I, I have all my US-based calls in the morning and all my European calls in the evening. So I've yet to learn to do power naps, but I've got to do power naps in the middle of the day. Um, siestas, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the answer. And lastly, what is your favorite project? So the Guardian, I think, really is a game changer. So that as, as kind of infrastructure, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, what I want to do is to be able to apply this to um, plastic abatement, ocean-bound plastic abatement. You know, being a marine conservationist, right? you know, there's, there's a huge, huge problem with um, the plastic in the oceans and the way that it breaks down and it gets into the, um, into the food chain. So. Um, when we've dealt with, with carbon and, and carbon sequestration and abatement, you know, my target is, um, is plastic abatement in the sea. Wow, I hope you live a really long life. I, I will not live long enough, I don't think, for that. I actually think in a, in a, in a future world, we'll, um, we'll have 
yeah, if we get this wrong, we'll be extinct. In a million years' time, when what, whichever other species has evolved, when the birds of the avian um, uh, populations evolved to the point that uh, it has uh, sentient, the architects will find this very thin layer of, uh, of plastic, and, and that will be all that you know, uh, represents us. And of, of, of course, they'll call it the Plasticine period. But um, <laughs> you know, if we get it wrong, that's going to happen. Uh, but I think we've got every chance to um, to turn this around with you know, the right level of um, focus. And I think actually, post COP twenty six, I'm I'm detecting a, a, a sea change in attitude from from the corpus all the way down to you know, the grassroots. So you know, I'm, I'm reasonably positive. We just got to save as many species as we can along the way. Yes, we do. I hope you're right too. Yeah, I hope I'm right too. Let's see how we make this happen. Let's make this happen, Everybody. right? <laughs> Everybody, let's all do our part. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. My very great pleasure. Anytime. And that was Rob Allen. To connect with Rob, follow his work and learn more about the HBAR Foundation. Check the links in the description. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to send me questions and suggestions. I am nonfungibleab on Twitter and love connecting over there. Have a wonderful day. I will see you on the next vlog. Bye.